morning. A few uh, announcements before we look at God's word. Uh, first of all, concerning Gary and Pat Johnson, they did mention last night that uh, uh, when our board met uh, a couple weeks ago, we decided to uh, place the Johnsons under the category of missionaries at large. And I assured them that did not mean large missionaries, as they mentioned last night. Uh, Kenya won't be a field in which they're going to go to full-time anymore, uh, simply of age and, and uh, abilities. So uh, we felt it would be best to categorize them at that, to give them freedom to go as the Lord would lead in various areas. So that worked out very well. Uh, secondly, Pastor had mentioned this uh, gentleman from Guatemala. Um, well, in a sense, the Lord did answer the prayer. The Lord took him home. Uh, his cancer was the means upon which uh, he is now completely healed of that cancer, and he's in glory. So that is an update for him. And then thirdly, tonight, uh, we'll be over in the prayer room. I uh, have a PowerPoint presentation that we're going to look at uh, that portion of the Great Commission and therefore I trust you'll be able to join us uh, for that. Open your Bibles once again, please, to our scripture reading, Romans chapter 16, those first 24 verses. As we think of missions, I don't think we could think of any greater missionary than the Apostle Paul, and he is our focus here in this and really in his life. You know, in the eyes of the world, Paul's uh, frail frame uh, really seems to be absurd, uh, even comical in standing in front of the, the powers of Rome. You read descriptions of him as being a, a small man, small in stature, uh, poor eyesight, uh, other issues of health, and yet he was the man that changed the course of history. His heart was mightier than the Roman Empire itself. And to be honest with you, none of our lives would be, to be the same today had it not been for the missionary heart of the Apostle Paul. As we think about the missionary impact of Paul's life, we want to consider uh, the horizontal aspect. In other words, not his relationship to the Lord, but his relationship to those around him. And that's where I think it, it touches us. Our horizontal relationship shows us that our missionary responsibilities are before us. And I doubt that apart from the Lord himself, there was ever a man who had a heart on fire for missions as the Apostle Paul. The first point we want to see in this horizontal relationship comes out of the first 24 verses, and it's Paul's loving heart, a heart of love. And this first characteristic really shows it overflowing. The list of names that you have here in front of you in chapter 16, uh, giving greetings, salutations, uh, Paul's genuine love for these people. Uh, he greets, he salutes 22 times, mentioning these. And 18 of them are from Paul itself. Our text here features 24 of these people were from Rome, 17 men and seven women. He also mentions two households, the mother of Rufus, the sister of Nereus. Uh, nine of the people cited were with Paul in Corinth, eight men and one woman. Obviously, Paul maintained a remarkable number of loving, kind, warm relationships with people that he met and worked with. And to be honest with you, I doubt if we normally think of the Apostle Paul this way. Many would naturally assume that he was a great man, and his greatness, his intellect, made him unfriendly. Maybe that's because we have people like that in our own life. Having read through the book of Romans and knowing the massive intellect of Paul, most of us would feel somewhat intimidated if we had to spend the afternoon with him. You get that Naturally, Brother Keith said, turn your cell phones off. But in the next couple of minutes, if all your phone rings and you see, oh, it's the Apostle Paul. He wants to meet with us tonight. Well, we'd head on home and we'd start boning up on our, our Old Testament prophets or we'd start reading in this part or this part and in order that we feel that we could match his intellect when we would get with him. And no doubt that time would be profitable for us 
but we have to realize that Paul was a people person par excellence. Paul didn't define his friendships by intellect, by their theological knowledge. The Apostle Paul defined his relationships through the Lord Jesus Christ. What makes this list of those he knew in the Church of Rome so amazing was the fact up to this point he had not been in Rome. His Roman trips come later on. And he talks in this letter with great affection about these people because that's where his heart was. Most of the people he mentions are those whom he had met on journeys and later on would take up residence in Rome. I believe it was Delta Airlines that first instituted a tracking device on your personal luggage. Put it on there and as you're going on your trip you can see where your luggage was, warding off the idea of getting to your destination and not knowing where your bags were. Paul's tracking device heart knew where his friends were geographically and spiritually. You start to see a picture of this man, of, of the character, of the quality, of the loving heart that he had. Think of the energy and the time involved in keeping in touch. Imagine Paul on ship begging for information from fellow travelers. How's Aquila? Hey, what's Hermes doing now? What, the, the, is he still walking in the faith? How about this one and that one? What can I pray for? You can see him trying to reach out and, and find from anybody he could the spiritual and the geographical condition of these that he held dear in his heart. We know from the testimony of scriptures that that's the way Paul was. He routed his journeys and scheduled his travel so he could pick up as much information as possible, as well as ministering to the various churches that he had seated. Paul was one of the greatest intellects, the true masters of theology, but he was one of the most caring men who loved so much. You know, names are important. They're important to Paul, they're important to us. I was told that if you visit the Natural Bridge in Virginia, there is a stone wall where are all types of names inscrawled on there. But on the high side, over on one edge, above all of the other names, was the name Scratch George Washington. <laughs> yes, the father of our country decided to put some graffiti up there as it was his name. He couldn't resist doing that. Our own names are music to our ears when we hear them. And certainly Paul knew that. But it's also true that you learn the names of those that you really care about, right? You learn those names and you seek those people out. And some suggest that's the reason why Paul could easily recite and dictate the names in these letters. He had somebody doing the, the writing. It's because they were before him in his prayers constantly. These people were important to Paul, and so he brings them up every day. And as he writes, or as he dictates these names to be written down, they're almost as these people have come before him afresh. Obviously, it would take more time than we have to fully deal with all of the names, but I want us to look at a few and help us to get a little glimpse of what we're talking about as far as Paul's loving heart. The first two verses, take a look. Paul mentions Phoebe. And in those four verses, in those two verses, you see four names that is acquired to her. A sister, a servant, a saint, and a succorer, or a, a patron, a, a, one who helps. What a marvelous characteristic being described to this one. Verses three and four, he greets Priscilla and Aquila, who'd risk their own necks for him in Ephesus. That phrase in verse 4, who have for my life laid down their own necks, undoubtedly brought great warm thoughts and feelings to Paul as those names came out. It took him back to those situations, how these people cared for him and how he cares for them. Verse 5, he greets Epideus, the first convert of Asia. Verse 7, the apostle says, Greet and Andronicus and Junia, my fellow kinsmen and fellow prisoners, who are note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. These men were brother Jews. They were even closer because they spent jail time 
with the Apostle Paul. They are outstanding believers. Go down to verse 10. He greets Apollos, who is approved of Christ. Uh, one commentator calls this an incomparable epitaph. What a loving bouquet for a fellow soldier. He describes these people, and it's just not words. And I think sometimes when we write letters, or more apropos today, send emails or text messages, we pick up a few words that relate a, a fact or figure of truth. But Paul sits and he's writing these letters, and as these words are coming out of his mouth, he's going to these people and he sees them on his heart, and he knows this wonderful relationship that he's had, the blessings that God has brought to them over the years. Verse 12, Trephania and Trephosa, probably twins, given names together here. Their names meant dainty and delicate. You can think of these, these, these two little quiet ladies, but Paul employs this great irony here, and he calls them workers in the Lord. These frail little ladies, dainty and delicate, and yet they are dynamite in the labor of the Lord explosive powers they've given of themselves in their work for Christ. Down to verse 13, we have one called Rufus. Who is he? Well, if you look back in Mark chapter 15, verse 21, it identifies Simon of Cyrene as the father of Alexander and Rufus. Couple that with the fact that Mark writes this letter mostly to the Romans, and we conclude that Rufus was the son of Simon of Cyrene, the one who carried the cross of Jesus. Commentator William Barclay writes, Now if a man is identified by the names of his sons, it means that, although he himself may not be personally known to the community to whom the story is being told, the sons are. To what church did Mark write this gospel? Almost certainly he wrote it for the Church of Rome and he knew that the church would know who Alexander and Rufus were. He was the son that Simon of Simon that carried the cross of Jesus. What a relationship that's going on. The people knew that and Paul picked that out, not to catch their attention, but because of the beautiful relationship that was there. These parade of names that pastor had read in his closing chapter, I think reaffirms his affections for brothers and sisters in Christ in the church of Rome. The best explanation is this horizontal affection is given by Paul in 1 Thessalonians 2. He says, but we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls being yet dear unto us. And you see this heart opening up to these people. We, we want to impart unto you the gospel. Yes, there's a message, but of ourselves. Paul reaching out and seeing that and ministering in such a way. I think Paul's loving and warm-hearted example challenges us. If our hearts beat with something of the pulse of the Apostle Paul, we would be people, persons, affectionate of each other. Some time ago, an 87-year-old widow in Grand Rapids, Michigan, appealed to the state to place her in a nursing home. The article wrote, quote, I don't blame people for not taking the time to see me. I'm not very interesting. Everybody I knew is dead or moved away. I'd like to talk to somebody who's alive. I'd like some company. You can see her description, how she's opening up. The newspaper article reportedly reported on her situation and went to note that except for a shopping trip once or twice a month, this widow rarely left her apartment. Her day began at 6.30 in the morning, breakfast with toast and coffee. Then she would water her garden in the kitchen, consisting of five small potted plants. After tidying up the place, she would spend the rest of the day looking out 
her window. She went to bed at 8.30 at night after a light supper. Kind of a sad story, isn't it? But all too often, that seems to be the plight of people. In his book, The Greening of America, Charles Reich says, America is one of the vast, terrifying anti-communities. The great organizations to which most people give their working day, the apartments and the suburbs to which they return at night, are equally places of loneliness and alienation. Protocol, competition, hostility, and fear have replaced the warmth of the circle of affection which might sustain man against the hostile universe. It's a cold world. I used to remember I was born in the city of Buffalo in the time before air conditioning, many of you can relate to that, where the porch was the great community organizer. You sat on the porch and you knew everybody in the community. But as the air conditioning came along, you never sat on the porch anymore because it was too hot and too humid and you really don't know what's happening in your community, what's going by in the streets, what's taking place. We had uh, probably two or three weeks ago, all of a sudden I said, there's a fire truck that went by. So we all get up and all the neighbors come out of the house, a couple of houses down. They had police cars and a fire truck. There was some odor in the house. People have been there for I don't know how long, but nobody knew anything about them. That seems to be the case for the world in which we live. And the problem, of course, is that the church is often as cold as the world. Sometimes strangers cannot pry a grin from church members. And it's imperative that we remember that people are important. We talk about missions. And we say, well, this is the work of the missionary, and this is a, it is the work of the missionary because we are missionaries. It begins in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the uttermost parts of the world. It doesn't mean that we are exempt from missionary status. People are important. The absence of agape love in the typical church should burden our hearts. We need to learn to love and to reach out to those who are around us. So what's the answer to our dilemma? I think, first of all, we need to become people persons. And some of you might say, hey, I can't. It's not me. If we're businessmen and business keeps on going so fast that we only become numbers, well, there's something wrong. And we've heard that, that type of discussion. If we're scholars devoted to our books, we need to remember that our books are not an ends to themselves, but they're platforms upon which to launch the gospel in a better understanding. The names of people around us must be important, and we should remember them so we can care for them. It's our outreach into this world. But not only are people important as persons, we have to learn to be affectionate. Chuck Swindoll tells the story of a Wednesday evening prayer meeting one time, and he noticed a rather large motorcycle type of man. He says, burly, six-footer with a motorcycle helmet in one hand, and after the prayer meeting, comes up to him and he says, you know, I've wanted to do something to you for the longest time. And Chuck says, I was a little bit hesitant, not knowing what to expect. And he says, the guy put the helmet down and wrapped his big arms around me and gave me the biggest hug. I wanted to do that. Well, the man indeed showed what we don't always have to have happen, full body hugs. And I'm sure <laughs> pastor's handshake is pretty good, but I don't know if we'd all accept his hugs around us. But you understand the idea. We're more than a name. We are people, and showing an affectionate attitude towards people that we really care about is indeed important. Paul's example challenges us to a deep affection to show more than a sincere eye contact, but to be able to reach into the lives of people who would appreciate even a hug. Before we go to a second section this morning, I want us to see that, oh, Paul was a great giver. Paul was also a receiver. There were blessings that came back to him. 
In Galatians 4.15, Paul testifies that there were some in the church who loved him so much that they would have plucked their eyes out for him. And sometimes he'd say, well, that's, he's just boasting. But he's writing out of sincerity, and he says, I know these people, and I know what they would do. I know their hearts. I know the direction that they're given. So in our text, verse 13, Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Did you ever think about that? His mother, Rufus's mother, and mine. What's the relationship that is expressed here? Well, we won't really know, but I guarantee you that there were no doubt times when Paul could use a little mothering. And I think the mother of Rufus spent some time mothering the Apostle Paul. And he says, she's special to me. It's just not fixing the meal when he's in the area, but making sure there are things that Paul needed to hear and needed to learn in his life. And so he says, this is really special to me. The words of the Lord Jesus in Mark 10, and Jesus answering said, Verily I say unto you, that is, there is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or fathers, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands for my sake and the gospels, but he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. That hundredfold principle was Paul's. I guarantee you that as Paul poured out his heart to, in affection, lovingly to the people around him, he received back brothers and sisters and mothers and lands and so forth a hundredfold times. And that was not his intent. But that was a byproduct of the loving heart that the apostle had. And it was seen in everything that he had done. The richest people in town are always those who love the most. People persons, the affectionate, those who love to remember the names and pray for them because they're important to them. They're just not on a list, but these are important to them. And they hold them up, and they know that. So Paul was a man with a loving heart. Secondly, from verses 17 through 20, we see that Paul has a protective heart. Uh, this section here is very forceful, and it lacks the restraint that we might transitioned into in this spot and he says here in verses 17 18 and 19 now we beseech you brethren mark them which cause the visions or fences contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them for they that are are such serve not our lord jesus christ but their own belly and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple for your obedience is come unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. Three protective suggestions, well, almost very powerful suggestions that Paul gives here. The first, in the first part of verse, uh, verse 17, he says, Mark them, watch out for them, those who caused division. Paul had no sympathy for a sleepless theology, for indifference towards the truth. He says, these things are important. Make a mental note of these people who are off base. Secondly, second part of verse 17, he says, avoid them. Reject heresies. Reject the heretics because of the destruction within the hearts that they cause. And then thirdly, second part of verse 19, I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. This is a, an echo, really, of what Jesus had given in Matthew 10, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. It's great advice. It's great advice. Look at what's taken around and, and be mindful of the situations that these are in. This no-nonsense advice clearly demonstrates Paul's aspect of horizontal love 
that it is not only an extension of that love, but it's protective. Those you love, you protect, don't you? Your children, your spouses, your, the people that are part of your family, the pastor for his church, his congregation, it ought to extend out. I love these people, I know them, they're dear to me, and I do that which is right to protect them. And that ought to be our attitude in life. We need to love in such a way that we really put it on the line for others and to speak truth in love. Third aspect of showing this horizontal relationship is in verses 21 through 23, and it's Paul's contagious heart. He's loving, he's protective, and he's also contagious. I picture the scene in chapter 16 like this. They're sitting in the house of Gaius, and in the men around, and the aged Paul has a, a, an open opportunity to start talking. He dictates this letter to the Romans, his friends there at the house of Gaius. To Titus is writing down the words of Paul, and Timothy and Jason and others are sitting there and they're listening to the words. And they too know the people, and they knew as they listened to this man how he's pouring his heart out to those that they know also in great joy. And they interrupt him and they say, say hi for me. Me too. Me, uh, me uh, I agree with them. That's, yes, that, that's me. I, I want that. So Tertitus writes in verses 21, 22, and 23, Timotheus, my fellow worker, and Lucius, and Jason, and Sopater, my kinsmen, salute you. And I, Tertitus, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. Yes, mine host, and of the whole church, saluteth you. Erastus, the chamberlain of the city, saluteth you, and Quartus, a brother, and their whole hearts follow Paul's lead. Not because it's, oh, it's a cool thing to do to follow Paul, but they're in it because the love that Paul has is contagious. All too often the world around us, we fall into this contagious aspect, attitude. Uh, Paul Harvey, how many of you are listening to Paul Harvey in times past? I love those, those radio clips. You know, the good news. Here's the good news today. And I gravitated to it because all of the rest was garbage news, bad news. And so here's Paul and he's saying, these are good things. And these men gravitate to it and he says, yes, we have the same feelings towards them. And so we need to have such a surrounding of ourselves. We live in a heartless world. Varied statistics, but I think this is pretty much accurate. The last major census that we had in the United States missed at least 5.7 million people who were anonymous, even to the census takers. Just not there. Every year, hundreds of identif unidentified or even unidentifiable bodies are found across North America. And only one out of 20 of these bodies a name is ever attached to. Our society has become a breeding ground for lonely people. Life in today's world is very much like the unwritten rule in elevators. No talking, no smiling, or eye contact allowed without written consent from the management. You ever been there? Just, we get into crowds of people and we don't want to look, we don't want to make contact, we don't want to say anything. It just, we just, and we feel so isolated. Dr. Leroy and his, um, after his wife died, uh, they moved him from the regular apartment out there in Lancaster down to the, uh, what do you call it? Skill care, like, you know. And so he had his wheelchair and, and, and he says, I went into the, the dining room for lunch and things like that. And he says, I pull up to this one guy and says, hey, how are you? I'm Bill Leroy, you know. And, uh, and he says, the guy just sat there with his head down during the whole meal. He says, the next meal, I went over to another table and they just, you know, no conversation. He says, I was blown away by this. Loneliness, disappearing, just people who just are there, but they're not there. And how are their hearts? How do they feel? What is the interaction that's there? 
The survey was taken in a suburban area of Houston to find out what motivated people to come to a particular church. 37% said they were influenced in truth and fact by friends and neighbors who took an interest to them and invited them. The majority of the people came because people took an interest in their life. Obviously, the value of, of the gospel track put it in the hands of a person, uh, scripture portion, I'd like you to read this. That's powerful because the Lord uses those situations. But the Lord uses the greater situations when I am in personal touch with somebody who has a need, especially of Christ. And that may come down the road, but, you know, this one's sick, or this one's been locked up in their house for so long, or this one is like this, or this one is, and I have an avenue to make a difference because I have a heart that's become a people person. And I want to be able to bring that heart to them and, and to be able to eventually protect their hearts and to see that contagious attitude happen. It's a joy and it's a blessing. Though Paul was a superior intellect in the early church, and though Paul had a heart that burned for the glory of God, as few have in history, he would not have been used like this had he not had a heart for people. And I don't think that was the case. I think as the, the stern, uh, rigid Pharisee, uh, he was a man of business, and he was for himself. But there was something that took place as he, uh, as he came to know Christ and, and as he surrendered himself, knowing more and more of Christ and what Christ would have him do. And maybe that's what we have to do. We have to say, Lord, make me to be somebody who is a people person. Help me to be sensitive to the needs of those around me. Help me to know names, just not to know names as a list of names, but people that I'm interested in that I would pray for them that I would make a difference in their life, that you could use me to bring your glory into their life. And I think most all of us would say there, was, there were people like that in our lives. There were people like that in our lives. When my wife and I came back from the state of Washington up to western New York, uh, obviously it was my mom and dad that were important in getting us in the church. But there was one man by the name of Herb Grover, and he's with the Lord now. And in, it was a fearful thing as an unbelieving couple to enter into a church with lots of people and, and the, the singing and you had no idea where's this book of Job, you know, and other things like that. You, have, you don't know what's going on. And Herb Grover was there every single morning and he'd come in and he says, hey, Keith Millie, he says, and I knew he had a heart for us. He knew that. And, and he was there and he welcomed us in and he made us feel comfortable. He made us feel that we were not the, the, the stranger. You know? And that wasn't just for us, that was who he was. And God gave him that. A heart which loves people, a heart which remembers names, a heart that is with a good word for brothers and sisters, a heart that is protective, a heart that is contagious. Um, they're not here, but Gary and Pat had, have that heart. And our missionaries have such hearts like that. Uh, their time in Kenya, then onto the Holy Land in Israel, and then back to Kenya again in West Virginia. And I could go down the list. You, you can't go to a foreign country, learn a culture and a language, and, and expect to have people all of a sudden start coming to the missionary, you know, to hear the word. You've got to have a heart because the different culture, the different language, everything, you have to show yourself to them that you care for them, that you really love them. And that's where the, the work goes. Is it any different here? Is it any different in Collinsworth or Haddonfield or, or any of these? It's not. It's not. Brethren, pray that God would give you a loving heart, a heart for people, names, names that you pray for, interaction in their lives, working with them, and allowing the Spirit of God to take his word into their heart to make a difference, to bring them to himself, to protect them, and to make them contagious, even as you are contagious. Let's pray. Father, we pause 
this morning and realizing how important uh, the, the, the display of Paul's life is for us today. Uh, truly, um, our communities, the world in which we live, is filled with, with the evidences of sin, um, which for many people, uh, it's just caused them to um, hide, to seek back, to be afraid, to keep locked up. And yet, if they're locked up, how can the gospel be brought to them? Uh, Lord, bring into our hearts a comfortableness, an ease in talking to people about you, even getting them to know us, that as the, the doors open and the, the windows open and the barriers start coming down, that slowly your word can be seeded into their hearts. This is a not a foreign mission work, Father, as you know. This is a work to bring the gospel to the lost here and around the world. Bless these seed thoughts to our hearts, and we pray it in Christ's name. Amen.